Hello, everybody. So what we want to first do is get the volume right. So let me know if you guys can hear us. Um, we have as our guest, as it says on the title of the video, uh, Carl Mueller. Hi. So let's start off, Carl, give us a little background on your so basically, the basics of who you are. What do you do? Who I am. I'm still trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm a trombonist. Uh, um, have lived in the Houston area almost all my life. And um, uh, certainly uh, uh, being a professional, have had a lot of trumpet friends and I um, had some in uh, college um, that uh, were using the burp oh, yeah, for their uh -huh. own practice and they and it was back when the burp was a straight straight line okay it, it wasn't off to the side like it is now okay and which uh, because it was straight line, it came out oh, was several inches, and then you put your mouthpiece in that, <laughs> and the trumpet players were were telling me they go to play and they pop them, pop, the yeah, face. they hit yeah. themselves in the face, and and I have uh, my my dad was. Um, mechanical engineer, machinist that taught me um, about using a lathe and stuff. And I made my own mouthpieces uh, for the trombone um, that these friends, the trumpet friends in college would, knew about. And they came up to me and said, hey, we know you, you know, design make mouthpieces can you make something better than oh, than the burp uh -huh. that won't you know endanger us from, <laughs> you know, from from hitting ourselves in the face uh, and so i thought about it for a while and came up with the brass buzzer design and and i gave them to him and I, you know, and they said, wow, this is great. Uh, Jim Mawson was one of the ones, too. Okay. Uh, so let me say hello to these guys. Gabriel says hello. Yeah, cool. And Anthony, Anthony is, lives in Houston. Oh, okay. He says hello and long time no see. And he says hello specifically. Oh, to yeah, you. good. Hello. <laughs> so, um, Well, how long ago was that? Wow, probably 30 years ago, something like that, uh, maybe even longer. Uh, yeah, they said, well, wow, this is good. You could probably make some money doing this. So, Was it always brass? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, always brass. Um, I am basically the same as it is now, but back then I... I didn't know how to solder the two pieces together. So I, you know, knew in brass instruments you silver solder. Right. So I just went and got some silver solder. They, you know, sell it at uh, Home Depot, you know, mainly for, for, um, uh, plumbing pipes. You know, uh -huh. pipes and stuff and so I, I kind of fooled and got them stuck together but that didn't work very well and people and friends uh, broke them off you know? <laughs> and they said wow this is cheap <laughs> <laughs> But then I learned to braise. So I'm actually brazing the two pieces together. And, so and brazing, tell me about brazing. Is that like with a, a torch? 
Yeah, uh, you have to really heat up the brass hot. Okay. For enable, because it's almost pure silver that you're putting in there. Okay. You have to really melt it to get it hot. Uh, to and it's strong now, so I haven't had any problems. In fact, uh, one guy, uh, he got his mouthpiece stuck on it, stuck in it, you know, uh -huh. and he took a hammer to it, uh, and it still didn't break. He he bent the whole thing in pieces, <laughs> but it didn't break. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Let me grab one. I should have thought of this before we started. So this is what it looks like. I think I showed you guys a couple weeks ago. So that's the part he's talking about. And the brazing just is the, uh, the weld between the two. Right, right. So there's just two parts, the ring and the shank part. You just okay. put them together. So And... um. So, along the way, I think you. Re I remember you telling me that Jim Thompson. Mm -hmm. What he? Uh, well, it was actually Bob Walp that told Jim. And Bob Walp. Bob Walp is trumpet player in in the Houston, the Houston Symphony. Symphony. Yeah, uh, and he's you know got connections everywhere, uh, but he told Jim about my product and. He liked it a lot, and so he since he's been having his studio use him there at Eastman, um, and um, um, hopefully they. I mean, they still buy him there, so I assume he still likes them. <laughs> but yeah, since I started making these, and um, I kind of designed it. I don't know. When you put your mouthpiece in, it'll the place that the mouthpiece sticks out to. Well, this is not a good mouthpiece to do that. Uh, kind of lines up. Hopefully, this uh, similar spot on the shank. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, so you can leave the mouthpiece in there and just turn it one way. So put. The, this in the horn or put the mouthpiece without taking it off. Right. That's that's why I like and I've told these guys this before. That's why I like your design more than any of the other designs. And that's what my video was about is because I don't use this in my routine. Mm -hmm. I use this only on the music. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I'm practicing a piece and I'm having accuracy issues, mm -hmm. I'll go back and forth between the two, and it's just so easy to do that. Right. Whereas right. with the other ones, you have to pull it apart. Right. Right. And yeah. I, now I know there's a new design, the plastic one, but it's still not as easy as yours. Yeah. Well, the burp, they apparently saw mine, uh, Mario Guarneri, uh -huh. uh, which I'm at. He's a cool guy. I mean, great trumpet player, too. Uh, but I guess he saw mine and made his offset like uh, mine, but it clamps onto the lead pipe, uh -huh. uh, which you have to leave it there and then switch just the mouthpiece. I guess that's better, but not. I still like this, though. I, I think it was more good that you just leave it on there. Yeah. And some some trumpet players have, have told me, several actually, that having that on there is like a, a what do they call it, enhancer, tone enhancer. Tone enhancer right. That it, uh -huh. it actually boosts this tone a little bit, just keeping it on. It's probably from the weight, right? Like, like when we put, just people like get the weighted mount pieces. Yeah, it's a, it's a price similar. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh, that I I didn't think of that when I decided, but but yeah, several trumpet players have told me that 
that helps with that. So were you already doing work on the lathes before you started doing this? Yeah, I, w I was making mouthpiece just Oh, that's right. Myself. You said you were making mouthpieces. Right. Do you still, yeah. make, still play on your own mouthpiece? I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let um, me see. Do you have one here? Well, the... Um, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the one I've been playing on uh, today, I modified. It, okay. It, and you probably can't tell this. It was a Bach mouthpiece, but I modified it on the lathe. But the uh, what I'm a bass trombone player mainly. And my bass trombone play, uh, mouthpiece is all stainless steel. Okay. Just made it from a hunk of steel <laughs> took me forever to make it but uh but yeah I, it was fun uh you know do it in the summertime when i had sure time. uh and i can say i play my own mouthpiece so, so is that why it's a brass because everybody else makes those out, out of plastic well and and when i saw jim thompson he came down here uh several years ago with the Eastman Brass Quintet. Okay. They played at Rice. Um, he asked me if I could make it out of something else that would be lighter weight. He didn't want the weight of the trumpet to be different. Okay. Uh, and I thought about that, and it's like, well, that's not going to be so easy to do. Um, the, the brass is very easy to machine it's right. a, a uh -huh. softer metal um so and it's easy to raise those parts together now if i made it out of plastic uh well nowadays and i actually have been kind of doing some experiment with um 3d printers for for a plastic buzzer um but not to any avail yet i actually tried to, well i made one um and then tried to break it and i broke it pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's like well that's a failure uh because you you know if you're going to market it you want it to be durable right and certainly right. the brass ones are most so let me let me an answer Anthony's question real quick because yeah. he asked this question last week and I just never got oh, you go. to, to talk to him. He says, is it okay to skip the daily routine for one day and just go straight to music? Because I have a lot of music for three concerts and a recital. So um, if you're following... Now this is an option, okay? Don't this is not ideal, but you know, life doesn't always work out. And we have to go with that ebb and flow that life gives us, right? So if you want, you can do. And this is something that I started doing a long time ago. I can think of my day as a 24 uh, a 48 hour day. Right? So you do your your routine do the music the rest of the day and then more music the next day you can spread it out like that what we're trying to strive for with the routine is just make it regular but yes i now if you were to ask me the same question in reverse if you were to say can i go straight to the routine and skip the music i would say no <laughs> okay <laughs> Don't skip the music. But if you're saying, can I skip the routine? I will say, yes. Just make sure you get a good warm-up. Right? Okay. So, Gabriel says, uh, Mr. Mueller is a mouthpiece maker. And, yes, sorry I'm at work and couldn't follow the beginning of the Q&A. So, we're talking to him mainly, well, mainly because he's a friend of mine. <laughs> yes. And um, But because he makes these best buzzers. So um, now Gabriel is, he lives in Italy. Oh, cool. So he's the one that designed and um, creates these mouthpiece uh, buzzing devices. He calls it the brass buzzer. And as I was saying earlier, I use this 
um, mostly for working on music. Mm -hmm. And it's always handy. Uh, I actually told my student earlier that I was going to have you as a guest today. And she goes, oh, I have one of those. Yeah. Right? So, you know, in talking uh, to people through the years, too, uh, everybody uses it to to make themselves better. Of course. I mean, that's what it's of course. for. Uh, but in different ways, and they're all good. What? Right. Yeah. You know what I like is, you know, because there are so many gimmicky things out there that people are trying to sell. Mm. What I like is precisely that, is that this is not that. This is actually something that's helpful. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, you know, you have those guys. I remember there, there were people that were trying to get you to put a piece of plastic in your lead pipe. <laughs> <laughs> right? And they would tell you all the science behind it, but it's still a gimmick. Mm -hmm. but, and it's not, it's not to help you practice and progress and get better like what yours is. Mm -hmm. um, those are shortcuts. And people love their shortcuts, huh? And they'll pay money for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So this is not that. I mean, it would be nice to spend a few bucks, you know, to magically make yourself right. better, but it doesn't work right. that way. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So Gabriel says, thanks for, for staying here. Okay. Uh, Jared Eitken says, taking talking, fixing trumpets, the spit valve on my trumpet, old ambassador, the seal inside of the brass fell out. What material should I use to fix? I tried cork, but didn't stay, and I tried silicon. Same. So do you do anything like that? Uh, you know, I, I don't uh, much. I, I have, well, I've kind of put my horns together too but the silver soldering and that's i'm sure what he'll need to do is solder the spit valve back on um that's an art form right those uh repairmen at the music shop they they really are artists in that respect that it it, it takes a good deal of practice to get that to I gotta tell you the story. Right. I gotta tell you guys the story about my father on my first trumpet. <laughs> what did he do? Because one of the braces came loose mm -hmm. and he had a torch. <laughs> <laughs> and he got himself some silver solder and started torching this bugger mm -hmm. and the whole horn fell apart. He didn't know about he sinks. And um, the whole, that's how I got my first pro horn. <laughs> my dad tried to fix it. <laughs> so, um, so the whole thing fell apart. And he decided, okay, it's time to go get you a, a, a better trumpet. <laughs> so I, I can certainly attest to that in my own trying to fiddle with things yeah you solder one thing and another thing comes undone because it heats up right that's um, right so that's what he did and the whole horn and you know what else he didn't understand was the lacquer so the lacquer was ruined too right right yeah you don't see lacquer because it's clear right but it'll so, burn off right away mm. so so um but you're saying that in the shop they'd probably be fixing that with silver solder they will, yeah, and the, and their uh, torch that they use uh, is very specific for repair work. Okay, I mean, so it's small but very hot, so it can heat up that that little section. area real real quick. Not like my dad's where, garage you know, torch. <laughs> Yeah, which <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, so they'll do a much better job at a repair shop than I could ever do. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, 
Oh, and, uh, and then one fellow asked about um, making mouthpieces. That's not something that I um, sell or anything. Sure. I've, uh, I've had certainly uh, several trumpet players ask me before, hey, can you make me a mouthpiece? Um, and even though I make it for my trombone, uh, the little bitty, you know, bore size and backboard, I don't have tools that small. I see. So I couldn't make one for a trumpet, right. uh, uh, much to the demise of my trumpet friends. <laughs> They're still bugging me to this day to make them a mouthpiece, but I can't do that. But, uh, but I'm glad that I was able to help a lot of trumpet players. I mean, I used to sell those all around the world, mm -hmm. uh, probably some to Italy, uh, certainly uh, in Europe, uh, Japan, I sold stuff. But ever since a few years ago, the post office prices went way up. <laughs> Well, I know you, all about that. You so, so, know too. so, so part of the story here is that we used to sell his. We we used to. Oh sell yeah, his, yeah, you did right? too. Yeah. The reason we stopped was because of the postage. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um. We don't sell our books anymore. We don't sell. Um. I used to sell other people people's books. I used to sell your stuff. I used to sell that oil. Mm. Um. But when we were looking at. Now, here's the weird part, right? Because we have family in Ireland. They can, and, and also friends in England and other words, you know, um, they can send us a package that's actually heavier than what we can send them for a fraction of the price. Yeah, it doesn't seem so. And right, <laughs> you know, so it, it really is the, when it comes to like the, the business side of what we do, the, the postage really thing that, that really is a, 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 a difficult problem. Mm -hmm. And the way I looked at it was the only way we would ever be able to go back to selling physical products is if those products had a very high price tag. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 They would have to be something that sells for like a hundred bucks. Right. Then you don't mind spending you know, the, the extra money to sell it. But if you're selling a $20 product. Yeah, well, that's with these. I mean, the postage was more than the product. Right, and, and, and the problem is not that we don't want to do that. The yeah. problem is that the customer is not going to pay that. I wouldn't want to do that. That's right. The customer yeah. is not going to pay that. Yeah. And I remember last year seeing an article about how Amazon and places like that were getting a special deal from the government oh, really? for discounted postage. Uh, yeah. oh. Okay, that we don't get, and and as far as I'm concerned, that's just wrong. Mm. Yeah, and it's also wrong that, in my opinion, but of course I'm I'm biased because you and I are we're in business, and this has affected our business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's wrong. That we that that big business can afford postage mm -hmm. to you know cheaper postage and we yeah. can't the ones that you know yeah it you know uh, being a musician and so I make money there and private teaching uh, selling these uh, buzzers has always been just a side sure part-time sure, sure. but yeah i mean it it affects it i hardly ever sell overseas anymore right. hardly right. ever i uh, still canada and mexico are cheaper so i do sell uh -huh. some but even that one pretty high up so um, yeah everything seems kind of out of whack these days right yeah all right, so Anthony says thank you. Mm -hmm. Jared says thanks. Jared says, 
The slit valve metal itself is fine. Oh, okay. It's the interior seal. Oh, like the cork in there? Yeah, the cork, I guess. Yeah, that you can just. So you they don't they use super glue or something? Super glue? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> don't they don't they use uh, our rosin? contact contact cement? Don't they use rosin to glue the cork in there? Yeah, I don't know. No, I don't, I don't think so. That's not why. Okay. No, I don't think so. Now some some I think are just pressed in enough to where they don't use anything. But I use I think they use like contact cement or something like that. Okay. Just to kind of dab it and yeah. make it stick. All right. Gabriel says, I have a question on mouthpiece making. I made my own cornet mouthpiece, then mm -hmm. I silver plated it. Now mm -hmm. I would like to make the bore larger. Do you think I can do it after the plating? Thanks. You can. Uh, it'll take the plating off and you'll have to replate it. Uh, if, if you want to do that, you can still you know, as long as the rim is still silver plated, um, you can play with the bore unplated. So when sure you say can. bore, um, Gabriel, what, when you say bore, what are you talking about? Because the, the names of the parts change on the mouthpiece. So we have the throat and we have the back bore. Oh, is that what you mean? Back, uh, bore is like the throat. Yeah. So, and so then the, there, there's the backboard. So, the, but what's inside there that you're not actually touching? The, uh, the the reason, main reason for silver plating is to keep the brass off of your lips. Uh, so brass the, is a poison, right? Yeah. So the one he says the one after the cup. So you're talking about the throat. Um, now yeah. we just use a reamer on the throat. Is that correct? Um, usually the reamers are tapered, that would be on the backboard. Uh, well, uh, but if straight, uh, they make straight reamers too, so you could do that on the bore. So yeah, I have, I good. have, well, maybe you can tell me. Yeah, do you have one? So you could, you could make the, the actual the smallest hole in there, the bore, back bore, throat, however you call it. Or you can make that larger. It would take off the silver. So if plate. you're just on the throat, you wouldn't really need to re-silver. Re Is that what you're saying? Right. You don't just, even need to re-silver that. No. Because we do this all the time anyway. Yeah, the, you wouldn't need to because you're not touching it. Now keep it clean because brass can pit um so this know, is this uh, is what i use on mine that would be for the back bore my won't fit on my back bore <laughs> it's too big <laughs> it's too big, big i for have the back one board. like that too yeah i could see this working on the trombone but it it, it bottoms out before i get to the end yeah you probably need uh like a smaller right, angle right smaller angle uh-huh but they make they do make straight reamers too, or like it's like a drill. But a reamer gets it actually smoother. Right. When you do it, it's smoother wall than an actual drill will. But same result basically. Yeah, I've seen people do it with the drill. I didn't like that because it's it is straight. Right. I thought it needed to be curved. You can have a straight part, but then the backboard needs to be angled Curved. to get to the which bore, is what, which okay. is what that is. I get. just got this from Harvard. First. Now, some <laughs> some mouthpieces don't really have a straight part. The, it but, just starts right away angling, right. but some do. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought that the physics of a straight canal on the mouthpiece on the throat was different from the physics of a it'll make it a different sound yeah sure make it play differently some prefer that some don't and, which is why i was using this instead mm -hmm. of a drill because i don't something about and there's, there's no there's no science behind this <laughs> don't don't get me wrong but it just seems to me that that 
that um, having a a parallel mm -hmm. bore bore for that amount of time in the throat, something about that doesn't appeal to me I, on a on a heart level. Mm. I know that sounds weird to say that. Well, uh, you know that's uh, perfectly fine. I mean there, that's why there's so many different makes and mouthpieces and right. stuff. Everybody that's why right. chooses the sound that they want. And that's, I, I'm a very big proponent on people getting what they want. Um, you know what I mean? I have a good friend in Austin that plays trumpet and he has a big box. He must have 50 mouthpieces in uh -huh. it, you know? Right. <laughs> you know, he tries everything uh, and, you know, I think most professionals will try it. A bunch. That's right. Of course. Find find what of works course. for you. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um. Eddie, this is from Gabriel. Eddie, didn't you didn't change the time in Texas, do you? No, that's the the time change is tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Sun, uh, Believe it or not, tomorrow night. So we Sunday haven't we haven't changed yet. We change over the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, he also says it sounds too much like a trumpet now. I, so I thought to make it larger. Oh, as far as boring it out? Yeah. So what mm -hmm. should I make larger, the throat or the back bore, to make the more cornet sound? That should be the cup. Uh, cup matters too. I uh, would think. So, are you so doing? I, the, are you doing this on a lathe? I would assume you'd almost have to have a lathe, right? I think I seem yeah. to remember in my vague memory you saying that you had a lathe that you do this on. I designed my cup. I make. I made a strange experiment. Please don't laugh. I put some honey in it. And studied how it moved in. And that's not that. Hmm. I, I like that idea. Oh, no, that's pretty good. Okay, so it's not the depth of the cup; it's the shape of the cup. Okay, for cornet, you want a V cup, not a not a C cup. We don't want a bowl; we want a a V. I hope that makes sense. I think that's more typical, right, of cornet yes, mouthpieces? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, almost like a French horn mouthpiece. Yeah, right. So for that and the flute horn. Yeah. Yeah, if you think French horn's a good example because they're very mellow. Right. Uh, so if you, you know, more V. So that's what I was saying earlier because if you understand the difference between cornet and trumpet, so trumpet has more of a uh, less flare for a longer period. Mm -hmm. And then, whereas the cornet is stepping out from the very beginning. Yeah, conical. Really. Con more, more conical from the, f throughout the instrument, oh, yeah. right? Um, so I thought I would much rather have curves in the mouthpiece than to have a cylindrical section based on what, what we're talking about here mm -hmm. right I, I would I, because I prefer a more cornetti sound than a, a trumpet so that's why I play on this mouthpiece not this one this other one this is a for a trumpet mouthpiece that's deep mm. right that my whole finger fits in there yeah you know so that's that's what I play on I did a brass quartet brass quartet gig on Wednesday mm. Um, using this mouthpiece, so yeah. yeah, you know every bit of the mouthpiece, whether it's the cup, the bore, the back bore, it, it all makes a difference in the sound. There's different things, but usually the cup affects the tone part more than others. Right. Um, that's that's how I. Um, and, and yeah, but even there in the back bore, back bore affects tone some too, uh, but not as much as a cup. Cup right. is probably the biggest 
tone uh, producer in a minute, at least. So he says it's a VC mix. So is it a double cup? Is it like a, a cup with a cup inside? We call that a double cup. Do they have double cup trombone mouthpieces? I've never seen one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do. They have that's, other things nowadays, but I'm, I've never seen one. That's, they have that. They have a lot of, um, you know, people. There's some people that like that, and others people that that think it's a gimmick. The double cup. Mm -hmm. uh, what it's used for is to people for people that want that the the benefits of a shallow mouthpiece. So that first cup, it tends to be shallow, mm -hmm. but then the V inside gives mm -hmm. it a little bit more warmth so it doesn't sound as harsh as mm -hmm. what those shallow mouthpieces usually sound like. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's used for, is to give the lead players a, a more, a fuller sound. Mm -hmm. Because they usually have, you know, with those shallow mouthpieces, they don't get a good sound. Right. You know? Uh, yeah, I certainly couldn't. So Anthony asks, isn't a V cup deeper? Doesn't have to be. That's right. Yeah. A V cup. Um, so that's why we specify a deep V. So like this mouthpiece company, I'm thinking about becoming one of their their um retailers. Um and this particular size, this is what I play uh, for the high note. Well, not high notes, playing lead on it in loud bands. The It's a shallow V cup. It's actually labeled as uh, a shallow S with the V cup. So it's still got a V shape, but it's going to be a shallower V shape instead of the bowl shape. Gabriel says, what is the advantage of a heavy mouthpiece? Uh, that's probably debatable too, but most everybody I've talked to um, says that it projects the vibrations through the horn um, either quicker or more intense. Um, so, so the sound projects a little bit further. Um, I, I, it won't change, um, particularly the, the sound, the tone itself, but it'll project the sound through the instrument more. That's what I think and what other people have told me that uh, not scientific there, but that's. Uh, so do you do any of that? Do you do heavy? Well, what I make is, is pretty. Because thick. of steel. Yeah. And, you know, I, when I'm making the outside and the inside, I want enough metal there that I don't. Lose accidentally go through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I never Ru thought of that. Ruin a whole week <laughs> of work, you know. <laughs> but, That's funny. But so it comes out kind of heavy and it seems to project the sound uh, pretty good, really. So you're saying that now yours is a medium heavy size? Uh, uh, as far as my own, yeah, it's, yeah, uh, certainly, and because it's steel, I would call it a heavy wall, uh, yeah, uh, where, you know, like Bach makes their, what do they call it, megatone, do they? What? Yeah, megatone, uh mouthpiece and Dennis Wick they've had uh heavy wall mouthpieces same kind of idea mine's sort of that way just because it's uh, it might not be as thick but because it's 
stainless steel. It, it's uh, really heavy. Cool. Gonya, hello, nice to see you. You can still get a full sound on a shallow mouthpiece, but it's a bit harder. Yes, that's when, when we talk about what they call the player system. You ever heard that language before? No, I have not. So basically, the idea is that the resonance doesn't start here. Mm. The resonance starts here. Mm. So you're actually resonating the column of air in your lungs, too. So if you can accommodate for the shallowness of the mouthpiece by the way you play mm -hmm. with, you know, and it's not just, I'm not suggesting that that's where you do it. I'm saying that this, it's not just the other side of the lips. It's, it's also what's happening on the inside. Oh, for sure. And um, so, yes, you can get a full sound. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, whatever you do, everything in trumpet and brass, is is give and take mm -hmm. whatever you give over here something over there has to be taken mm -hmm. there's no there is no um uh magic yeah formula quick fix yeah quick fix. Right. you can't yeah. just you know the way in. the way i view it is more like uh speakers like your lips are the speaker itself uh, and the sound goes through the instrument but there's all these science of different speakers about what goes on behind the speaker the enclosure of the speaker the shape yeah. that's in there which is yeah down in your lungs and mouth cavity all right. of so that. they call that the player system Okay, I learned something. <laughs> <laughs> Player system. And and um, yes, it's possible. The problem is the complexities of that, right? So you you want now? Not okay. I'm not suggesting that it's a problem. Of course, great players play on shallow mouthpieces, right? I'm not. I'm not suggesting. The problem is when you go outside of what's normal for you. So let's say you don't normally play on a shallow mouthpiece and then you pick up the shallow mouthpiece. Now the whole player system has been offset. So it's not, and so you're going to be less accurate. Mm. I know this because it happens to me almost every day. <laughs> right? Yeah. So because I do switch around a lot. Mm. I don't use the same mouthpiece. Didn't Maynard use a big mouthpiece? Like yeah. Real big. But, but I think it was... Size wise, big, but I think it was also shallow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm not a man of, uh, you manner. know, uh, yeah, I think anybody can take a mouthpiece and really try to manipulate to get a good sound. That's you, right. uh, you have to, you know. I love those stories, it. and there's so many stories of it like this. Someone will go to the teacher or the clinician or something and say, um, Make a comment about how well, yeah, you've got that horn, and that's that's a, that horn sounds great. If uh, if you had to play my horn, so the guy will take the guy's horn and play on it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that happens all the time. They give them money, you know. Yeah. yeah. Anthony says, "Just kidding. I couldn't resist telling a joke." <laughs> <laughs> what do you right. think, Mr. Uh, Mueller, what reverse. do you, this is from Gabriel, Mr. Mueller, what do you think of the reversed system on an intonation pump? Intonation pump. I don't know what an intonation pump is. The reverse system on an intonation pump. And I don't know what the reverse system is either. I'm sorry, Gabriel. I, I'm clueless as to that. what that is. Um, but I'd be curious to find out. Uh, intonation pump. Gosh. Uh, the slide for into oh, like a tuning slide reverse oh i think i know what you mean so as far as on the tuning slide um 
one side has the inner and outer arranged, the other side has the reverse inner and outer. I, I, I'm guessing that's what you mean for the tuning slide, which I, I know that that's, uh, yeah, tuning slide. Yeah, you know, um, uh, that's been done a lot on trombone in recent years too. Makers have have made it to where the airflow goes this this kind of the same way through both sides of the tuning slide. That's why I play on a reverse slide. Yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So. I because it's always up step instead of down step, right? That's the theory behind it. I uh, did experiment with that on my own horn and found that I liked it better the old way. Maybe I'm just old fashioned, but that's how this works, right? Just because something might be scientifically more sound doesn't mean it's better. Yeah, you know, if you like the other way, then that's the way it should be. Yeah, that's, you know. And um, I'm not even sure. It's, I, I don't mean that it was scientifically more sound. I'm saying hypothetically, you could have something that makes more scientific sense. Right. I, you know, I. And it still wouldn't be better because. I, I definitely don't want anybody to say that I prefer one way or the other uh, or advocate that because that was just my own personal taste in in uh, playing I didn't find that it made a whole lot of difference really uh, but I did find that there was some, enough there to where I preferred it the the other way which is the way I grew up with right and maybe that was but um, e even if that was the reason why that's still legitimate. Uh, uh, illegitimate. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. exactly. This is what I like. That's the way yeah. it's going to stay. <laughs> Which is, you know? I mean, good that there are choices. I don't, you know, there. Because you know what? The turbulence that happens inside the horn, because that's what they're trying to avoid. Yeah, right. But that turbulence makes yeah. a difference. Right. And if you like that difference, right. then you're going to want to keep the turbulence. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would just uh, not play in trumpet. I would think that that would matter more in trumpet than trombone because the, the tubing is obviously bigger on trombone. So, right. Um, so, so what you, that makes sense, right? Because, because the tubing is bigger on the trombone, the step is less significant. Right. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. I, I would think so. Um, so, um, plus on the trumpet we have more rounded tubing, so that the turbulence is already greater. Yeah, you know, a little passageway. It's got to be more resistance in there, right? You know, so, so yeah, it could help. Uh, uh, oh yeah, is your Bach reversed? So is that yeah, a Bach? You're that's a Bach. On? Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Box so, not are not normal made that way, right? Right. But you had that. So I done. ordered it. I ordered it this way. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah. So Anthony is asking, does the Yamaha make reverse tuning? So I have no clue. Mm. What? The last time I bought a Yamaha was in 1990. I still have that horn. It's beautiful. Uh, piccolo trumpet, yeah, yeah. but um, yeah, yeah I, I know there's a lot of makers that have been going that direction, but um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know either about Yamaha, but I, I do know about Bach because that's mainly what I play is Bach. But, that their tuning slides stock or not reversed.
So Aunt Anthony says, is a leaky trumpet always a bad thing? Because I have one that is leaky, but plays good with a thicker piston oil. So leaking in the valve? Yeah, I think he's talking about the, um, the, the air leaking through the valve casing. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Well, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> You mean like like <laughs> technically mean? Yeah, it doesn't sound like it would be good playing, but there again, like we were talking about reverse, if you like it, that's what matters. Keep it, yeah. Right. Uh, but I wouldn't think that leaking. Well, I I would I would uh, say there, Anthony, that if if you can put thicker valve oil and it doesn't leak is that sound better than when it does leak do you have an opportunity to experiment yeah <laughs> uh, find out which way is best and so if it's better if it doesn't leak well that you're gonna have to try to fix Gabriel um, asks what about the gap between the mouthpiece and the lead pipe does it really affect playing Mouthpiece and lead pipe. What what gap? So uh, there's this. Uh, it may be different for trombone. Yeah. So that's just a, a mouthpiece receiver. Right. So so this is the lead pipe here. So right now the the pipe here's here's how this works. The pipe comes to here, and mm -hmm. the mouthpiece will never reach the pipe. There's always yeah. a, uh, a gap between. Yeah. Right. And if they do get too close, um, the horn won't play. Really? Oh, wow. Because huh. there are positions that the horn just won't play. Wow. You know how, how one of the ways that I figured this out, these, so I've never had a gap problem before. Um, and there were things that people used to say about equipment that I thought this just can't be true. And I ordered a bunch of mouthpieces. There, there was a company, I won't say the name of the company because I don't use them anymore. Um, but I ordered uh, on my credit card, they let you have like 10 mouthpieces, a dozen mouthpieces, mm -hmm. and then you can try them and ship and back. accept the ones right. you don't want back. Right. And I was testing these mouthpieces. And I told them the range that I wanted and the mixture that I wanted. And I, I, I was playing some of these mouthpieces. And I'm not making this up. And they all had the same rim diameter. Mm -hmm. The only thing that was changing was the combination of cup and, and back bore. That's mm -hmm. the only change. Mm -hmm. And I'm not making this up. Some of those mouthpieces, I could not blow the air through hmm. and they were not clogged up hmm. it's, uh, the, it's the lips the physics of the wind resistance. the lips would not vibrate mm -hmm. the air hmm. there was something wrong with those mouthpieces and it was just in the design hmm. yeah that i can i can understand that too it's it was a huge. Uh, so that opened my mind to this kind of stuff about like the throat. I mean, I mean not the throat, the the, the gap and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Because I used to think, how could that make a difference? Well, now, it definitely does make a difference. I I will personally attest to that. Now, on on trombone, uh, the lead pipe is inserted. It's you know ten nine, 10 inches long, um, usually soldered in there. Uh, not the same as what the trumpet lead pipe is. Um, and they have a Venturi. So, so the, the mouthpiece you put in is tapered and it goes to the Venturi, which is the smallest diameter of the lead pipe. Okay. And then from there, uh, widens outward to the bore of the horn. Um, and certain mouthpieces don't go up to that 
small Venturi I see. area. Some do. Um, and so when, on when it gets to that Venturi, is there a... It's because the mouthpiece gets smaller as it, right? Yeah, right. So, so, so there's a, a definite little straight part and it depends on which lead. So what I'm asking is the, is the opening of the mouthpiece just not in contact with the lead pipe. The contact is actually at the edge of the... Um, the, the, the sides are all in contact with the lead That's pipe. what I'm saying. So that means right. that suggests then that the opening is not. Uh, so you could have the end of the mouthpiece go right to the venturi. Okay. So there wouldn't be... So if it doesn't, well, the mouthpiece stops. Uh, the uh, mouthpiece holder, which I guess is similar to yours, keeps angling at that same okay. um, rate and then gets to the straight Venturi part. So after the end of the mouthpiece, it'll actually open up more before getting straight and then, so it's it's kind of stepped in a way. Right. And I know that that makes a difference in playing. Um, with, you know, there again, it's like, well, do you like it that way or do you not like it that way? And um, I, being a, uh, experimenter that I am fooled around with shaving off the outside of the mouthpiece where it'll fit in further. And how does that work out? And and so getting closer to that Venturi part. Um, I like that better. Okay. But a lot of in in even non Bach mouthpieces, they don't make it that way. Right. So so and they've had years and years of practice, so they obviously thought that that wasn't the way to do it. Right. To have some step in there, like right. kind of your talking. That's what about. I'm talking. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, and so, apples and oranges. That's I think right. you know it's whatever works. Uh, uh, All right, so guys, we're we're at the hour mark. Man, thanks went, for hanging out. That went by fast. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, man. So, um, maybe we can have one more question if you guys have a question. Um, and then we'll we'll shut it down for today. Um, counting down: five, <laughs> four, <laughs> three, two, and one. Okay. Well, you guys, I know it's been two weeks since I've, three weeks since I've seen you guys because I had gigs. Um, I'll have to tell you guys someday about the weird gig I had last week, but it was cool. Um, nice to see all you guys. Oh, there's Mr. Yeah. Peters. Um, and we'll see you guys next week. Okay? I think next week. Don't, don't take me on that. <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. Have a great week. Oh, that was cool. <laughs>